Greetings all from beautiful downtown Lewisburg near the campus of Bucknell University. We're gathered this evening for a Lincoln's Birthday Week event to kick off a series of webinars focusing on how we, as a divided America, can come together again as Americans. Tonight's webinar is sponsored by the Tucker Brawley Raymer Initiative for Informed Dialogue in the Liberal Arts Tradition of the Bucknell Program for American Leadership and Citizenship in association of Bucknell faculty and Bucknellians and co-sponsored by the Open Discourse Coalition. To keep up with future programming, please check out bucknellleaders.org. That's one word, bucknellleaders.org. Our speaker tonight is Professor Wilfred McClay, now at Hillsdale College, whose recent acclaimed book, Land of Hope, an Invitation to the Great American Story, helps explore what that which unites us as Americans in our history in a scholarly yet readable way. He will speak tonight on Toward a More Perfect Union, Lincoln's Legacy Today. Professor McClay is the former GT and Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma. A former member of the National Council on the Humanities, he is a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and a member of the Society of Scholars of the James Madison Program at Princeton. His many other academic activities include being on the editorial advisory boards of the Wilson Quarterly, First Things, and the New Atlantis. After his talk, he will respond to questions which may be entered on the Q&A tab on Zoom. We'll try to get to as many questions there as time permits, and they will be visible to us on the panel. Professor McClay, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's an honor to host you virtually at Bucknell. Thank you, Father Paul, and I really appreciate being with all of you, and uh, I, I hope it is a more, uh, more equable uh, climate right now in Lewisburg than it is here in, uh, in Norman, Oklahoma, where, where I am now, where the, the temperature is hovering around nine. So, uh, uh, so and that, that doesn't promise to pass very soon. We're not used to quite that cold weather. So anyway, I'm here to talk about Abraham Lincoln and uh, uh, ways in which we can uh, fruitfully you know, appropriate uh, his his legacy, um, and, and make it our own, and look back to him as a a figure that is uh, worthy of our esteem, uh, and uh, who has clues, perhaps, to some of our current dilemmas. Um, you know, history is not always very easy to use in that way, but it's I think it's very important to to try to try to draw upon. That heritage. Uh, there, there's uh, uh, one of my recent books. I, I quote a uh, uh, lengthy passage from John Dos Passos, the novelist, which I won't repeat here. But one of the things that he says in this long quotation is that uh, in, in scary times, history takes on a particular value in that it provides us with a lifeline to the past. And that's a a guide and a help uh, and, and a comfort to us in some cases in finding our way through the scary present. So um, I think Lincoln may indeed um, have, have some messages, not always completely consoling ones, but for us. And uh, in general, I, I hold to the view that the past and our knowledge of the past is a resource, even when the things that we learn about the past are, are uncomfortable, are uh, morally troubling, even appalling. Uh, now, with Lincoln, we have glowing images, right? For the most part, we're, we're brought up to see him as one of our great national heroes, a figure, a monumental figure on Mount Rushmore, uh, or maybe we think, more often, I think, of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., which is <clears throat> features this gigantic statue of Abraham Lincoln, uh, uh, you know, like a, a, a giant, um, uh, a, a moral 
marble giant. Um, um, and uh, in this building that resembles a Greek temple, uh, uh, like a place of civic worship. And it has been that uh, for, for many, many years since it was built uh, in the, uh, um, in, in the post-Civil War era. It's been a gathering place for people, particularly uh, uh, groups that are struggling for reform of American society, uh, protests. Uh, maybe the mo single most notable such event was at, at the Lincoln Memorial and around the reflecting pool was uh, the 1963 March on Washington uh, that culminated in Martin Luther King's delivering his I Have a Dream speech at from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, it was, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a, a iconic moment in American, recent American history. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, Lincoln uh, is not, uh, and I don't think this has come as any surprise to any of you, is not an unqualified hero. Uh, to uh, many Americans, particularly, but not exclusively black Americans. Uh, although to many black Americans, he is and was uh, uh, a, a very much of a hero. Um, but King, King's address, which really repays a careful reading. Um, it, it, we all kind of know some of the refrains, let freedom ring, let freedom ring, et cetera. But there's, there's intellectual content there that's very important. Um, and and the, the thrust of the speech is to say that the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bible, the Christian, Judeo-Christian heritage, all of these are good things. All of them provide a basis for our movement. We are here in Washington, and he uses this image, uh, because the Declaration of Independence was a promissory note, and we're here to, to collect. There's an IOU that's owed. Um, so they were banking on the uh, validity, uh, the enduring validity of those documents and, the, and what they promised. Um, and certainly a high view of Lincoln was implicit in coming to the Lincoln Memorial for uh, the, uh, the propounding of these, these grievances. Um, and uh, so, so I have a dream speech is, is uh, implicitly relying on the, the, uh, the goodness, the, the, the admirable qualities of Lincoln's career and his achievements. On the other hand, uh, in, uh, at the same time, Malcolm X, who was in some ways King's opposite number in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the black uh, civil rights freedom movement of the time. He said this, it's time to tear down your shrines to Lincoln. He represents empty promises. So that's, that's another view and, uh, uh, and, and it's a powerful, uh, uh, powerful view. Lincoln, um, it, there are all sorts of things you can take him to task for and I'll talk about a few of them. Um, uh, so uh, the, the picture is not, unambiguous. And then as a matter of fact, we have many images of Lincoln. L Lincoln, there are 14,000 books about Abraham Lincoln. He is, next to Jesus Christ, the most written about figure uh, in, in the history of the world. Uh, that, that would seem to imply that there are a lot of different points of view about him, right? Um, I mean, you can't have 14,000 books that say all say the same thing. Um, so uh, and 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 the the uh, the historian Merrill Peterson has written a whole book about this about Lincoln's changing image in different times in American history. There have been many different Lincolns at different times, um, and sort of many archetypes that Lincoln has seen as embodying. You know, the self-made man, the savior of the Union, the liberator, uh, the great emancipator, the man of the people. Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and all of them have some truth to them, um, even if they're not the complete truth. Um, let me just run through a few. Uh, I don't want to be tedious about this, but uh, 1928, Stephen Vincent Benet, the poet, uh, who was drawing on 
a what I think I can call sentimental biography of Lincoln by Carl Sandburg, another poet, uh, he of the uh, Chicago city of broad shoulders, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, very successful biography, by the way, sold zillions of copies. And, uh, uh, and he described Lincoln not as what the corporate, the very, very skillful corporate lawyer for the railroads, among others, that, that he was, uh, but as I quote, a lank man, knotty and tough as a hickory rail, whose hands were always too big for white kid gloves, uh, whose wit was a coonskin cat sack of dry, tall tails, whose weathered face was homely as a plowed field. Homely, homey, um, callow, uh, backwoodsy, uh, awkward. His hands were too big for white kid gloves. That's, that's one image of Abraham Lincoln. Um, this is in around 1930. Uh, by the 1950s, this country boy Lincoln had uh, morphed into the, the most wise and prudential leader the nation had ever enjoyed. He steered the ship of state through um, wild excesses uh, of ideologues, uh, ideologues of the North, the abolitionists, uh, the fiery abolitionists, or ideologues of the South, the fire eaters, pro-slavery, advocates. Uh, Lincoln, in, in the view of the, the 50s, was a sober, moderate, sort of uh, down the center kind of force. In the 60s, as the civil rights movement begins to gear up, uh, Lincoln is at first thought of as a civil rights pioneer. But by the end of the decade, uh, he, he was uh, being widely criticized, even reviled as a racist uh, and a proponent of inadequate half measures, uh, a forerunner of the pragmatic liberalism that was so thoroughly drubbed by the new left in the 60s and 70s. And today, or uh, in recent years, uh, uh, he's yet, yet, there's yet another Lincoln that has emerged. And I think you see it especially in the use of him by President Obama, although there are there are others before who who took this view that, that Lincoln was a man of faith who also had a kind of epistemological modesty. He was modest about what what we can know and and about whether we should um, impose our beliefs on others. Uh, he, he was a skeptic. Uh, this this Lincoln who sought to do God's will, uh, as we see in the second inaugural address, with, without claiming to know it. Um, uh, and uh, a view that uh, is very attractive in a lot of ways to modern sensibilities, a, a humble Lincoln, a modest Lincoln, a, um, a Lincoln who is, has faith, but it's not overbearing about it. Um, it's hard to reconcile that with the man who so ferociously prosecuted the, the Civil War, and uh, which was the one thing that defined his presidency. So uh, that's that's a, a but Obama uh, was uh, uh, especially in his campaign uh, in, in 2008 constantly invoked Lincoln. He and, and invoked Lincoln. Uh, partly because a fellow man of Illinois, uh, I mean, even to the extent when he announced his candidacy, he did it in Springfield, Illinois, the capital of Illinois, where Lincoln uh, uh, lived for many years and made his reputation. Um, he took a train to Washington for his inauguration, as Lincoln had done. Uh, at the inauguration, he dined on Lincoln's favorite foods. Um, and he was uh, very often uh, uh, looked to Lincoln as a, as a kind of lodestar of a moderate progressive uh, form of, of governance. Someone who, who worked for the good, but did so with an awareness of the ambiguity and contingency of history. 
Um, and in a way, I, I guess in the end, uh, uh, not to tip my hand too much, but I, I, I sort of uh, uh, support that view of him myself. Uh, that I think that, the, that we have um, many images of Lincoln, many ways in which we uh, we understand the, the mark of his presidency. But you know, Lincoln often said, or he said once famously, that uh, I have not directed events, events have directed me. And I think one of the things about Lincoln that we need to always be mindful of is that he was, he was a politician, but I think a better word is that he was a statesman. Um, a statesman is, it can, can be a thinker, can be an intellectual, uh, can be a person of ideas, but uh, he or she also has to be an actor in the political realm, uh, has to make their ideas come alive, come real, become real, become woven into the fabric of political reality. It's sometimes said that politics is the art of the possible. And, and, and um, Tip O'Neill and many others have said that. I'm not sure where it originated. But I think it's a very good statement uh, that has maybe several different level, levels of meaning. Art, the art of the possible is the, you know, what you actually can feasibly do. You can't transform the world completely uh, overnight without, uh, well, without wrecking much more havoc than you sought to alleviate by, by this transformation. Um, it, to, do, to transform the world, uh, you have to do it uh, shrewdly, prudently, in, in bits and pieces, strategically, um, and with care. Um, so in that sense, politics is the art of the possible. It, it, uh, it's also the art of the possible in the sense that you can propose the most wonderful and dynamic piece of legislation, but if you can't get other people to vote for it, it's not going to go anywhere. So politics is the art of the possible. But I think there's another sense that politics is the art of the possible in the sense that it creates possibilities. Um, it, uh, it, it is, can be a tool for thinking beyond the given or envisioning ways that circumstances can be employed to produce an end that's not immediately obvious in them. So the art of the possible of seeing in the sort of chaos of events, what might be made to come out of them. And that it seems to me is also a characteristic of Lincoln's leadership. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about his life just to remind you of a few things, but, um, well, maybe I should do that first. Uh, now that I think about it, I, I, I wanted to, to try to pull out of his life uh, certain themes that I think we can fruitfully take away and, and, and also talk about in the Q&A. Um, but um, of course, his life is the stuff of American legend and, 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 and in a way, American national identity, this uncommon common man who emerges out of a very humble frontier environment uh, to become arguably the greatest of American presidents or, or certainly one of the two or three greatest. Um, and uh, among other things, probably the greatest of all American orators. Lincoln's speeches are matchless and uh, no less a orator than Winston Churchill said this about the Gettysburg Address that it was the, you know, it was the most magnificent use of Shakespeare's language. And we talk about pouring it on that, uh, that, that he, he knew of and that Lincoln was, uh, was just superlative. This is a man who had no formal education to speak of, um, who had this very hard scrabble, humble uh, frontier existence and, and who's, who read voraciously, he read everything he got his hands on, but among the chief reading materials that he had at his disposal were the King James Bible uh, and uh, the plays of Shakespeare. And, and uh, um, one, can, one can actually see 
the influence of both of these things all over the place in in his oratory, in his style, in his in his diction, in the the, the rhythm of his words. Uh, he uh, he was in some ways uh, very much a man of his moment, but he also drew on literary influences that were far away from his time and place. Um, uh, he he himself described his childhood, uh, alluding to. Uh, Thomas Gray's famous uh, elegy that uh, it, it was described, it's the short and simple annals of the poor. Um, and we don't know a great deal about his early life, but we know he didn't, um, he didn't like being on a farm. He didn't like farm chores. He, um, his family moved from Kentucky where he was born in 1809 to Indiana, to Illinois. Um, and he kind of, broke out on his own as soon as he could. Uh, he arrived in young man in New Salem, Illinois. Um, he, he was, in his own words, a piece of floating driftwood, a nobody. Uh, but he found employment as a clerk. He became part of the community. He ran, uh, he became postmaster. He ran for office. Um, and uh, made it on the second try into the Illinois State Legislature, the General Assembly. Um, he borrowed money to buy a suit uh, and, and was launched into, um, into a career in the law. Uh, um, uh, as Lincoln said, when he announced his candidacy for the General Assembly in 1832, so still a very young man, um, he was born and had ever remained in the most humble walks of life without wealthy or popular relations or friends to recommend him. But he had the opportunity, the frontier afforded him to realize his potential. And for Lincoln, this, this experience was a realization of what for him was the most fundamental American proposition. And that was uh, well, the set of propositions in the Declaration of Independence. He, and this is a theme he comes back to again and again, uh, that, that uh, the affirmation of the equal worth of every person, an equal endowment, equal entitlement to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, the, the uh, equal rights to men, of men to the fruits of their labors, which would uh, define his view of of slavery, that this was something grounded, this, these rights, equal rights were grounded in nature or nature's God, as Jefferson put it. Um, Lincoln loathed slavery from as, as early as we can find, as early, earliest youth, and uh, probably got this from his uh, Baptist parents who, for whom he otherwise had very little uh, affection that we can detect. Um, uh, Politically, he found his moment in the controversies over, uh, I'm leaving out a lot here, but the controversies over the what to do with the land acquired in the Mexican War, uh, the, the expansion of the nation westward. Because, you know, as you'll recall, the, the, the whole issue of westward expansion had been a troubled one, uh, that the Missouri Compromise was a sort of cobbled over uh, way of, of solving the problem or kicking the can down the road by uh, dividing between North and the South areas that would be open to accepting the expansion of slavery and, and those that would not be free states. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the more land that was added, the more this question became agitated over whether whether the Missouri Compromise would hold, and uh, eventually it does, uh, it does crumble in the in the 1850s. And this, for Lincoln, is um, is is a moment of of great crisis. Let, let me explain Lincoln's position on slavery. He he was opposed to slavery. He hated slavery. He never ever. Uh, defended it, to my knowledge, except to say that it was constitutionally permitted, which is true. Um, uh, 
what he thought uh, was the solution to the problem was uh, a more uh, kind of ameliorative one, which um, as the nation expanded, slavery would be proscribed from being uh, moving into successive territories moving westward. And after all, they didn't have the kind of climate for staple crop agriculture of the sort that the South, particularly cotton and sugar, indigo, that kind of thing. Um, uh, that required uh, a slave labor force so that the, the economics uh, he and others thought would be on their side. So if, if you could contain, it was a kind of containment doctrine. If you could contain slavery to the sort of Southeastern corner of what was be rapidly becoming a continental nation, then eventually um, that could lead to the, the weakening and extirpation of the institution. That was his, view, um, at least part of his view. Uh, and and uh, um, he also entertained uh, at various times in his life the, the, the idea of African colonization, which is one of the things that, uh, that his detractors uh, point out, uh, that, that this was something that he, he was more than intrigued by, although he never did anything as president to promote it. Um, so he saw his opening with with this uh, uh, expansion westward, what to do with the territories in the West and what to do on the slavery issue. Uh, he ran for the US Senate against Stephen Douglas, who was uh, a, a Democrat, um, a uh, proponent of popular sovereignty as a seemingly um, fair and democratic way of deciding the issue, but in fact represented a, for Lincoln, uh, a compromise of principle. Um, and he and Douglas Lincoln were, ran as a member of the newly minted Republican Party, which was the first major political party that, to oppose slavery uh, in the territories uh, and more generally. Um, and uh, um, you know, the opposition to slavery and polygamy were two of the pillars of the Republican Party platform when the party was founded. Um, so it was a brand new party and, and uh, they had run John C. Fremont, a rather obscure figure for president um, in uh, 1856. And so Lincoln looked after his campaign against Douglas, which I'll say more about in a second, he, which he lost, but he nevertheless came out as a, a national figure. And uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, as, as I say, he did lose the election, but he and Douglas conducted a series of debates around the state of Illinois, which, of which we have a, a fairly reliable record of these debates. And they're fascinating. Um, although I have to say that, that there, there are some of them, particularly there's one in Charleston, Illinois, that uh, one reads now with dismay because Lincoln uh, disavows uh, the concept of racial equality, and that, and that, which is something that, that we find very hard to read, hard to take, hard to, to even, you know, to respect on this, under the circumstances of the time. Um, uh, I, I will argue his case on that very, to a very limited degree uh, 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 later on. Um, so he ran for president on the basis of his good, if losing, showing in uh, Illinois, it happened he was running against the same guy, uh, Stephen Douglas, uh, in 1860. But he was also running against two other candidates from a splintering Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was falling apart over um, the various regional and, and slavery related issues. Um, uh, and uh, uh, again, I, too much to get into to get into that, but but. It was a situation in which uh, the possibilities of Lincoln winning were pretty strong. And he was chosen actually, rather than there were a couple of more, um, more radical candidates than Lincoln, William Seward, for example. Uh, um, and the party tried to find someone, someone who was a little more moderate um, with a little more Southern appeal. Um, and Lincoln was from Kentucky from Southern Indiana, you know, he had uh, uh, that part of the, of, the, of the country was as much Southern culturally as, uh, as uh, 
well, Kentucky certainly was the South and uh, Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana uh, had that character. So he, he was a little more acceptable to the border states that would be so important. So Lincoln, Lincoln had a very good chance of winning, but it was going if he won, it was going to be very problematic because he would, was not likely to get any votes outside of the, of the northern states. And that's how it came out. Lincoln won a great victory, but was the first president ever to be elected to, to office with a, on the basis of an entirely sectional or regional victory. Uh, he did not get a single electoral vote out of the South. Um, and Southerners had warned before the election that th this was an outcome that might be uh, impossible for the South to accept. They um, recurred to what's sometimes called the compact theory of the Constitution, which is the idea that the Constitution is a compact between sovereign states and that the states, as with any contract, have the right to pull out if that's what they feel the terms of the contract are not being kept. So, um, they, and they thought they could point to the, the Declaration of Independence, the same one that Lincoln so revered as justification for that. Uh, so soon after the election, South Carolina did just that and, and others in the deep South followed suit, uh, fo followed suit after that. So, um, uh, Lincoln, once Lincoln became inaugurated as president, he tried very hard to strike a conciliatory note. The border states, um, uh, his, his own Kentucky, which was a slave state, but did not join the Confederacy. And the hope was that um, uh, an all, all out Confederacy, a secession, uh, a successful Confederacy would be averted if, um, if a conciliatory tone was struck uh, in his inauguration. So it is remarkably uh, conciliatory on almost everything except secession, which Lincoln made it very clear that was a no-go proposition. The unity of the country was uh, all important. And this is one of the things I want to stress about Lincoln is his, his commitment to the idea of the union, to the national union, to the fact that it was something more than a compact of states, that it was it, 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 the Constitution and the Declaration, the experience of the revolution had created a new, a new nation, a new national entity. Um, and in the conduct of the war, uh, he showed, uh, and, and in his defining of war aims, um, he showed enormous sort of uh, prudential wisdom. Uh, at every turn, he was he was uh, politically astute, and I I should add that one of the amazing things that Lincoln was not really equipped for the situation in which he found himself. He was the, the arguably the only president um, to find his whole presidency was defined by the conditions of war um, from start to finish. Um, yeah, uh, and that was not, uh, he didn't have much of a, you know, sort of desultory military background. He was not um, even, uh, he, he was actually anti-military in a lot of ways. Uh, he, but he became, you know, one of the greatest of war presidents. Um, you know, he'd been involved in the Mexican war and had really uh, had grave reservations about it. Um, and we opposed it in the end. Um, so uh, uh, it, it, this was not a situation that he, that he came into naturally, uh, but he, he became very effective at it. He was effective in choosing uh, eventually the right military leaders to, to accomplish the complicated goals that he had in mind. Because after all, we don't, maybe we don't think enough about what a complicated thing it was to, to fight the American Civil War. I mean, in the first place, you had to make the decision of should, should we just let the South go? Um, and to say, well, we're just too different from one another. It, it's uh, Lincoln, no, he, he made it very clear from the start that was not an option. Um, that the, the nation would remain unified. And he did this partly because he understood that a divided 
United States would be quickly overmatched by uh, the European powers that uh, from which um, the United States had made such an effort to separate itself. Um, not only Britain, but France as well, um, and, and and possibly others. So, uh, and that that the, the the United States of America would be would be demoted to a, a fractious and second class status, uh, and that that what one secession might give way to other secessions or to the piecemeal appropriation of American uh, real estate by other countries uh, and uh, with the nation unable to do anything about it. So he, he, he wasn't going to go for that option. But then there are, there are other kinds of decisions that he had to make. Um, how conciliatory to be to, the, to be to the South? In what ways um, should he um, make a move against the institution of slavery? under these conditions of war, something he, he was urged to do by many and, uh, and yet held, held off from doing uh, for a time until the moment was propitious for doing so. He understood uh, the, the importance of isolating the South, containing the South, um, keeping the border states like Kentucky out of the Confederacy and uh, keeping European mischief makers out of the conflict on, on the Southern side, um, while gradually deftly redefining a war that began strictly as a war over the preservation of the Union and transformed it into a war for the extension of liberty uh, through the ending of the noxious and, and, and really um, an American in, in the sense of being in con not being consonant with the declaration and its principles, uh, institution of slavery. So um, uh, he uh, uh, pushed his military leaders uh, uh, towards a strategy of unconditional surrender uh, that by the time a war that started out uh, with the ex expectation that it would be short, uh, but it ended up becoming the bloodiest war in American history uh, still today. Um, so he, he, um, <clears throat> he was, uh, he had a very high regard for the law. Um, you can see this from his earliest speeches that the, the, uh, the, the, the fear, the threat of anarchy was uh, all powerful to him. He, and he had a very high view of the Constitution. The Constitution, even though the Constitution protected the institution of slavery, it did not uh, explicitly, um, uh, it, it, did, it did so in a way that um, uh, amounted to being something less than a full endorsement of the institution. As James Madison said, uh, you know, we, we wrote the thing, and you know, so that it would be clear that there's there is no property in man. That's his that's his words, and and Lincoln felt this was obviously right because the Constitution could only be understood as something built on the foundation of the Declaration of Independence, and the Declaration of Independence clearly gave no quarter for um, for this the institution of slavery being a legitimate part of the American. Uh, enterprise, the American experiment. Uh, but Lincoln, so Lincoln had this high view of the Constitution, which meant that he did not think it appropriate uh, to simply by fiat, as many would have liked him to do, and many looking back on the time say, why did he do this? My students say this all the time. Why didn't he just by fiat and give a beautiful speech that he was more than capable of writing? Um, in which he just pronounced the end of the institution of slavery. Well, Lincoln wasn't going to do that, partly because he was a, a lawyer and, and, a, and a good one um, who had this very high regard for law and that he could not perform such an act without stepping outside his constitutional definition and stepping outside his proper, proper and lawful constitutional role. But what he could do is 
as commander in chief of the armed forces, he could free slaves in those territories that were in rebellion against the United States as a war measures act. And in fact, that's what he that's what he did. That's how the Emancipation Proclamation came about and was and was justified. Um, it's a good example of the kind of half measure that um, his Lincoln's detractors find so frustrating because uh, they would have liked something more grand, more more sweeping, more universal, more principled um, uh, than 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 to uh, erode the, the the institution of slavery in that way. But it it did erode the institution of slavery, uh, uh, and it did the announcement of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is right after the Battle of Antietam, which is sort of one of the first semi-victories on the Northern side after a really tough uh, series of, of defeats, um, was a moment when, when uh, it mattered in terms of the rest of the world um, to announce to the rest of the world uh, this, this Emancipation Proclamation, put the Union Put the federal government on the side of, of anti-slavery and of eventual elimination of the institution. Um, so, uh, and it, the South had been hoping for a um, uh, an, an endorsement, a diplomatic recognition, recognition from Britain, which with which the South had important commercial uh, linkages, or um, other other uh, European countries, um, which could have spelled doom for the union cause. Um, so all of this has to be done in the context of a war that is being fought to bring the country together. This is not a war um, in the end that is against an enemy you want to pound into the ground the way that the Romans pounded the Carthaginians and ground them into the, into the soil and, and, and salted their, their cities. Um, uh, that that couldn't be the way, um, even if at times tactics like that had to be used or were justified. You know, Grant and Sherman both are generals whose tactics would have seemed abhorrent in 1861, but the, by 1864 and 1865, they it was pretty clear that something on that order would be necessary. Uh, really massive. Uh, deployment of forces with um, um, brutal consequences uh, ha was militarily necessary for the victory. So all along, Lincoln had had in mind the fact that when all was said and done, the point was to bring the country back together. So see what a complicated job it is um, to, to um, um, juggle all these things and try to produce the optimal outcome without neglecting any one part of it. And here, I think there, it's, it's a good point to um, bring up something that I like to uh, use in, in thinking about Lincoln. And it's a, it's a cat set of categories from the German sociologist, Max Weber, who um, said that there are really two different sort of ethics uh, that motivate political leaders, political action. And he called, I'm not gonna burden you with the German terms, which particularly given my pronunciation of German, but it translated, they are the ethic of moral conviction, ethic of moral conviction and the ethic of responsibility. And uh, there's two different ways of thinking about how leaders address moral problems in politics. The ethic of moral conviction, this is the, the purest. In, in his day, the abolitionists would have been that group. These are the people who called, I mean, the ultimate abolitionist was William Lloyd Garrison, the great Quaker uh, preacher and, and publisher of The Liberator, who was uh, completely, he was an immediatist in, in that there was no reason not to end slavery. Now, completely, boom. Uh, and uh, case closed. So that was his view. Uh, it was uh, uncompromising in the extreme. Um, and, and Garrison had a deep 
you know, critique of America. He burned a copy of the Constitution in public, saying it was a pact with the devil. Um, uh, so it, 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 you can't fault him uh, for lack of, of moral conviction. Um, he had it. And, and in some ways, I think there's some, some people, um, activists in various movements, civil rights, pro-life movement, who look to Garrison as a, as a kind of um, exemplar because he was so uncompromising. But then there is this other ethic, the ethic of responsibility. And, that, and the ethic of responsibility is, I mean, the ethic of moral conviction is let justice be done though the heavens fall. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's the, the, the moral objective needs to be achieved at whatever cost. There's a purity about it um, that you, you can't help but uh, admire, um, particularly when the cause is so, you know, obviously just as the abolition of slavery. Um, the ethic of responsibility takes a different view. And I think this was Lincoln's position, even though he didn't know anything about Max Weber, who had not yet written. <laughs> um, leaders, and this is the view, leaders must take responsibility for the totality of effects that arise out of their actions. They have to take into account the tragic character of history, that the fact that you can do the right thing at the wrong time or in the wrong way and do an immense amount of harm to good and innocent parties in the process. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's taking responsibility, it's an ethic of responsibility for consequences. So it is consequentialist, I guess you could say, in, in, in terms of philosophical terms. Uh, um, and Lincoln is, 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 I think, very much on the side of, um, of the ethic of responsibility. And yet he has um, a kind of um, moral compass that is, uh, is, is firm and, and unyielding. Uh, in, he never changes his view about slavery, the wrongness of slavery. He does um, broaden and deepen his views about on racial equality. You know, at first he was very reluctant uh, to consider the idea of, of uh, black serving in the army, in the federal army. But uh, in the end, he ends up embracing it. He, uh, Frederick Douglass, his relationship with Lincoln, which is a fascinating story. Frederick Douglass was the great black abolitionist who was born into slavery in, on the Eastern shore of Maryland and, and uh, um, educated himself and became a fantastic uh, orator and crusader for the cause of abolition. He started out as a follower of Garrison and, uh, and he was contemptuous of Lincoln. Uh, he ended up coming around to Lincoln's point of view, and he even uh, described the Constitution as a glorious liberty document. And he did so in the context of a speech in which he's uh, very, very critical of, uh, you know, the speech is sometimes titled, uh, what, what, what to the slave is your 4th of July? Um, uh, but he ends up endorsing the Constitution as properly understood, as Lincoln understood it, um, uh, as, a, as a liberty document. Um, so um, that's an, an interesting, it's sort of, there's a little bit of Martin Luther King and the Mal from Malcolm X to Martin Luther King in the 19th century. Um, uh, 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 although both uh, positions in the 19th century had religious uh, Contagions, and in the in the twentieth century, only kings really proceeded from a, a Christian uh, nexus. Uh, Malcolm was yet to have his religious awakening at the time he spoke those words. So, um, so Lincoln is is a statesman in that sense. A statesman is someone who is um, has to operate with within the context of circumstances. 
this is why I, I, when I talk about Lincoln, I, I wanted to say, first of all, um, you, you, it's not really um, historically fair um, to, to judge people outside you know, the context in which they, they find themselves, to, to impose upon them moral desiderata that weren't, weren't operative and were not part of the art of the possible in their time. Lincoln could not have stood up on that platform in Charleston, Illinois, and espoused a doctrine of racial, absolute racial equality to that crowd. It, um, it couldn't be done. Uh, there has to be, and there has been a, um, although certainly on the issue of slavery, he could. Um, and uh, th that, that was his, its greatest achievement was in the area of, of, uh, of writing out of the Constitution, of laying the foundation for the 13th Amendment, which is the way he thought was the proper way to get rid of slavery, is to, to amend the Constitution um, and something he worked for, uh, uh, you know, and, and to, that occurred after his death, but that was very much part of his intentions. Um, that that legal, um, Elimination of slavery, of course, did not did not end racism. It did not end discrimination. It did not end uh, uh, subordination of blacks to whites, white supremacy. Uh, it didn't end these things, but it ended an important legal prop for them. Uh, it ended a, 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 a an important legal basis for them, and it, and it it served to to um, cleanse. The Constitution of of its association with slavery and the, the maybe three places in the Constitution where there are uh, allusions to to it to the, through the three fifths rule and the and fugitive slaves and so on. Um, so let me just uh, I, I think I'm running out of time here. So um, why don't I uh, see if there's anything in my notes here that I haven't really touched on. Um, I, I guess one other thing that, uh, and, and I'll try to make this brief because I know I've been going on for a long time. Um, you know, we professors get paid by the word. So <laughs> uh, um, it, it's, I think uh, one of the things that when Douglas, um, wrote his encomium to Lincoln, which was very, you know, very subtle and critical of him. At one point he says he was the white man's president. Um, and, and he's very um, clear about the ways in which Lincoln uh, you know, fell short of what an ideal relationship to him might have been. But what, what he understood and what I think Lincoln understood is that the, um, the sustaining of the Constitution, the protection of the Constitution, and, and cleansing of the Constitution, but the, the maintenance of the Constitution was absolutely essential to the extension of liberty uh, in other respects. Uh, you need order, you need a solid grounding of the political order in order to uh, extend liberties in ways that will matter, that will be sustainable, that will that people will actually be able to live out and enjoy, and practice, and be settled in. So he understood that that the, he had, as I say, he had a high view of the law, and uh, and and Douglas shared this. He shared this sense that if, if you could abolish, if you abolish slavery and abolish the constitution in the process, you would have neither liberty nor order. So again, I think this is an aspect of Lincoln's prudential wisdom that, uh, that is worthy of our admiration, even if uh, we don't uh, fantasize about him coming back from the dead and plugging him into the presidency. No, he was a man of his own time, not ours. Uh, but we can reach back to him we can reach back to him and profitably um, and draw on his example. So why don't I stop there and, um, and we can open the floor for any questions or
brick bats. I can't hear you, uh, Paul. I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. Thank you so much for um, uh, the enlightening talk, uh, Professor McClay. And um, yeah, let's go to some questions. We have some good questions from uh, students and alumni here. Uh, maybe I'll I'll squeeze in one first, a quick one, uh, although it involves some broader things. And that is, why did you title your book, which is a, a well-written, substantive, one-volume, comprehensive history of the United States, why did you title it Land of Hope and not Land of Trouble or <laughs> Land of Racism or other things that might come to mind in the context of politics debate disagreement in the last few years in the country especially well let me yeah this, I, I i try not to be too long-winded about this but i had i i it's complicated it's not simply that i wanted a happy um happier image than 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 uh, you know land of violence land of atrocity land you know whatever um it, it what i meant to convey was yes it is it, i think that this has been there's a reason people from all over the world want to come here still today um, and where they're crowding at the southern border um, today. Uh, why uh, people have um, come across oceans uh, in, in under perilous circumstances to an unknown fate um, uh, all through our history. Um, uh, and in that sense, we've been a land of hope that immigrants um, who, you know, in a sense project their hopes onto us, but, but in many cases find those hopes being realized. Uh, some of the most eloquent um, statements, uh, you know, that, that you could ever want to hear about America are made by immigrants. And in fact, one of the letters I've gotten about Land of Hope that I really treasure was from a, a man born in the Philippines who uh, immigrated, um, uh, had no education, no background, no money, no nothing, uh, ended up uh, getting in, into college, going to medical school, becoming a specialist in his field at, at one of, I won't name it, but one of the um, Ivy League uh, uh, university related hospitals and medical schools. Uh, and he wrote me this passionate letter thanking me for, as he said, completing my journey. Um, and uh, th so there's that. Uh, now, I, something else, and really hope is a, it's a theological term, uh, it, it's, but it also has a secular valence. Um, it, uh, and I think what both of those things have in common is an aspirational quality. To be a land of hope is to be a land in which it's a premise that we almost all share, I think, that no one uh, born in this country should be um, restricted to the conditions of their birth. That no one should be uh, assigned uh, a, a status in life and said, "This is this is it. This is uh, you're going to do. Your your father was a swineherd. You'll be a swineherd, uh, and and that's it. That's all. That's what you were born to be. Um, we we have it in our bones, in our blood, uh, in our sinews to uh, to think that that there's always something better that that each of us can strive to. Now, this off I emphasize this in the book. This often can lead." To us being a land of disappointment, uh, because we have we 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 have we have these expectations, we we so to speak we get our hopes up um, uh, for a better life, uh, and sometimes it's realized, sometimes it isn't. Um, uh, there may be ways, uh, particularly in the, in the in the experience of certain minority groups, that that, that this has a uh, I, I'll use the word that's current now, systemic quality to it. Um, but that, that doesn't change the fact that the, uh, I mean, part of the reason people become very bitter towards America is because of these hopes, is because of these expectations 
that that are unrealized. And so I think there's a there's a there's a flip side to being a land of hope, uh, and I I I try to emphasize that in the book. So it's not all roses and lollipops uh, um, and gold uh, paved streets in the new world, uh, uh, but uh, it is it is a kind of optimism about human possibility that we all have uh, come into this world uh, with possibilities that are um, that are not immediately realized by the circumstances in which we find ourselves, and that America is that siren sort of siren call to us to strive for something something greater, something better. Uh, uh, so, oh, so, some of you may know um, Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. Um, and if you don't, uh, take a look at it. Because even though Tennyson wasn't American and he's writing about Ulysses, who certainly was not an American, um, it, it has this uh, very American come, let us strive for something great. Um, and uh, I know the word great has a certain valence right now for some people's ears. And so, uh, but but uh, it, it, it shouldn't be restricted to any party or any political movement. Um, uh, it, this is, a, this, it, let me just conclude this long-winded answer by saying that I think if you, if you would not really explain what America is if you didn't include somewhere in that description, that account, this aspirational character that is so much a part of us. And it's what people who emigrate to the United States uh, admire and want to take part in. They want to get some of that for themselves. Okay, so we have some great questions. I want to be respectful of your time and everybody's time. But uh, if it's okay, we'll try to keep you here a bit longer, Professor McClay. Sure. Um, as long uh, as the audience can stand me, <laughs> I can, I'm can. i happy to be with them. Yeah, well, I will be good for... Uh, I wish we were all in the same room. I, I'm, I'll never get used to this sort of virtual Gnostic existence uh, uh, that we're going through now. And, uh, right. and I hope yeah. I don't have to get used to it, but... Yeah. Well, good. Well, here's a question. Um, it, it feels very much like we are in the midst of a contemporary civil war here in the U.S. today, yet it seems that no strategy we employ to come together appears to work. Even the tragedy of the pandemic uh, just seems to have contributed to further division rather than people coming together. Um, what are the takeaways and learnings from Lincoln in his quest to reunite the country and what can we leverage and apply to unify this uh, once again to, to unify the country once again? Well, yeah, no, we're all we're all thinking this kind of thing, and and uh, um, I'll say a couple of things. One is that I'm old enough to have lived through the '60s. I was very young, but I, I was I was sentient, and I, I saw what was going on, and and in some ways it was a much more terrifying time in terms of the sort of tearing apart of the social fabric and uh, the loss of confidence in uh, political leaders. Uh, uh, the um, Vietnam War was just devastating to this country in ways that I don't think even now we've completely recovered from. Um, and, uh, and yet uh, we did. We did, uh, I think, by uh, yeah, the, the, the um, late 70s, uh, certainly the 80s, um, uh, we, the, we restored a, a certain amount of national unity. Um, I think the end of the Cold War has presented us with a, a real challenge because that, that, that's, uh, and that my book, Land of Hope, uh, I really kind of leave the, the, with the question, I leave with all these perplexities and anxieties that you've described in your question. Um, but I wonder if we have, are still searching for a new way of defining our, our enterprise as a nation in the wake of the Cold War uh, as, as of 1991, we'll say, uh, the end of the Cold War. Uh, um, 
and that's a long time ago. That's almost that's thirty years ago. So uh, so we're still we're still um, um, in in a bit of a quandary. Right? Do we? Um, and and some of what we've been going through in the last few years it, it reflects that. I mean, do we rethink the whole post World War II? Order. Do we still need to have troop American troops in Germany? Do we still need NATO? Do we still need uh, the, the national security apparatus and huge Department of Defense with globe-spanning responsibilities? Do we still need all of that? Is that is is that? Uh, and I, this is in my book. Uh, you know, is that something that we sort of had to do because of the exigencies of the the Second World War and then the Cold War, but now we can come back to the more modest role in the world that we used to have. Or are those responsibilities, as some people would argue, you know, enduring and essential to the peace of the world? Does the United States still have that, that kind of responsibility? I think we're struggling with questions like that. Um, and uh, I think what's sort of alarming it may be partly behind your question, but the sort of civil war references this sense of the, us becoming uh, two or more countries that the, you have uh, really the, the, the two parties seem very far apart in terms of uh, uh, fundamental value orientation. And even within the, the two parties, there's a sort of centrist right and centrist left that, that kind of coalesce and then there are further elements that are, that are quite disaffected. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's it, uh, I'm told that the China, there is no Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times, but if there isn't, there should be. We're definitely living in interesting times. I, but I, I, I take heart from uh, the fact that, uh, that we have, that we, we did, I think come back from the utter chaos of the 60s and and, and, and the failure in Vietnam um, uh, to um, to a reasonable degree of order and prosperity um, coming out of that and that that uh, that we may, we may be able to do it again. Um, I worry about a lot about things like our uh, the debt, our national debt, which has been jumping by trillions uh, by the minute during the pandemic. And uh, I think your generation, I'm assuming that's a student that asked ask this question, if not, forgive me, but uh, um, I, I think it's just criminal. The, the, the obligations that we are, uh, we baby boomers and others who are uh, either retired or on the verge of retirement are, are placing on your backs, um, and uh, uh, it's 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 all what can't go on forever won't go on forever. So, I worry a lot about that, and that's how my book ends: is with the sense that there there are certain insoluble problems that we don't seem at the moment to have a political class that is uh, up to the job in both parties. So, um, and I I don't think uh, yeah. The closer you get to the president, the more my authority as a historian diminishes. Um, so let me say one other thing about the, the, the question about Lincoln. I'm sorry that these questions are so good. I, I, I have to go on and on about them, but uh, um, unfortunately we don't know how Lincoln would have brought the nation together. In some ways he brought the nation together um, and not even all of the nation together in his death. You know, Lincoln was, the assassination was on Good Friday, which in, in, in a, in a you know, the, the day of Christ's death in the Christian calendar in a very uh, predominantly Protestant Christian country. Um, it made an enormous impression on people that Lincoln, who was a kind of national savior, was giving his life in a Christ-like way for, um, the, the 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 sustenance and preservation of the nation and uh, and and that did bring 
people together. There, there was a lot of acrimony towards Link and a lot of uh, sniping at him from all sides. I, I, I uh, it's, it, it, there's a book yet to be written about the all you know, one of the, this could be added to the 140,000 that have already been written about uh, the trashing that Lincoln got from uh, the press and his political opposition. I mean, it's just unbelievable the things they called him. Uh, all through the war. And, you know, he had to run for re-election in the middle of the war. And it looked as if he might lose um, in, in uh, uh, 1864. Uh, so uh, for a long time, uh, uh, they looked as if he was, he was resigned to losing. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm wandering off the point a little bit. Lincoln didn't get to live long enough to implement Reconstruction. That's really the point I want to make. Um, it's possible that his plan would, would not have been any more successful than Andrew Johnson's was. But Lincoln was not Andrew Johnson. That was one great advantage he had. Andrew Johnson was just the worst, I, I don't think he was the worst possible person, but he was a very bad person to be in charge at that moment when uh, some fundamental um, transformation of the the, the the particularly American South needed to take place in a way that was um, was equitable and not merely punitive, um, uh, and it it didn't it didn't happen. Uh, it it's I think some very good historians, Eric Foner of Columbia, have emphasized how much was achieved in Reconstruction, and I think that's that's true also. We, we shouldn't. Um, negate how great the task was to go from a, a slave society and in, pl in places like South Carolina, uh, you, know, you know, Charleston, South Carolina was a majority black city. Um, uh, to go from that to, um, to an egalitarian society, um, especially with the, in the integration of, of people who had been deliberately um, suppressed and denied education, denied capital, denied all the tools one needs to succeed in, in, a, in, a, in a capitalist, labor-oriented, labor market-oriented society. Um, it, it was almost a foregone conclusion, looking back on it, that, um, that without the creative uh, policies emanating from the federal government, um, all of that would rec recur to a kind of peonage that was a like a distant mirror of slavery. And I think that's that's a lot of what happened. So so I we can take heart from Lincoln in some ways, but he didn't he didn't stay the course not, through no fault of his own. He was shot and killed, but um, we'll always wonder could he have been more successful if he had been allowed to live? I say in my book that, that John Wilkes Booth in Assassinating Lincoln could not have done anything worse to his beloved South than that. Um, Lincoln almost certainly would have been better for the South than what transpired. Um, we have another question here uh, from a student who's uh, been doing uh, an honors project on Ralph Ellison, the famous African-American yeah. writer, and um, asks that in his, in Ellison's last work, Juneteenth, he regarded Lincoln as deserving of positive recognition due to his efforts to emancipate Black lives. Um, as Ellison was a former um, uh, participant in the radical left, um, uh, but how might he have found Lincoln's principles for union different and better from the communist ideology that he had been engaged with before? So uh, I guess that's taking us to back to the Cold War a bit, but also it might relate to divisions and different views of politics today, you know, radicalism, the role of the Constitution, so forth. Um, uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, it, you know, I, I, I'm not sure this is helpful. I'm, I'm a little bit shooting from the hip here because although I know, I know Invisible Man uh, well, I teach it 
and uh, and you know, and I know, I know a bit about Ellison, um, and of course, Invisible Man is in some way a transmutation of his own experiences, um, uh, often you know, phantasmagorical uh, transformation. It's a very interesting book, but. Um, and he's from Oklahoma City, just up the road here. So uh, uh, it, it's, uh, my students are always interested in that fact. But I don't know. I think what, what I would say, and, and this may be wrong, is that part of what Ellis, Ellison had um, the outlook of the, of, of the quintessential artist and it, his, his relationship to um, politics and to his racial identity um, was uh, interestingly contingent. I mean, he, I'll just give you an example. He, he cites as one of his greatest influences on Invisible Man, T.S. Eliot's lengthy poem, uh, The Wasteland, um, a really iconic product of modernist literature and, uh, and, and an evocation of the sort of modern post-religious disillusion, post-World War I kind of outlook of, of Europe at that time. But, uh, and, uh, uh, and he has said that parts of, I'm sure this, your student is aware of this, that, that there are parts of Invisible Man that, that derive from that. He, he's also, he's very interested in jazz and there are parts of his expository style that, that, uh, that draw from that. He was unwilling, and I admired this so much about it. He was unwilling to say, because I am a black man, I can't appropriate the, the European musical, literary, artistic tradition. Um, and at the same time, he wasn't, he, he was not willing to say, because I love and embrace and want to be seen as part of the European intellectual tradition, I have to renounce my blackness. He wouldn't go for either of those propositions. He insisted on both. Um, and that and that he, um, and that his um, particular set of experiences were a resource to be drawn on to contribute to that Western tradition, but what he, he did not see himself as being apart from it. Um, that's the, the thing I think is really key in terms of your, your um, addition to the question that, that, that what does this tell us about um, uh, where, we should, where we should go today. I think it's a huge mistake to see um, the, the Western tradition and, and even the, the name Western tradition as sort of off limits that um, that and and uh, to uh, the concept of of, of uh, cultural appropriation, I think is is completely alien to the nature of a civilization, which in fact is the incorporation and, and assimilation of different cultural influences into a larger and more rich and varied matrix or tapestry of meaning. So uh, I think I think Ellison's a great example of uh, someone who did not he, he was not going to he was not going to bleach himself out he was not going to process himself out of his black identity in any way but um, but he also saw himself as a as a creative artist working in a long sort of apostolic se session of great artists. Um, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois also writes this way um, when he talks about uh, his his relationship to the great authors of uh, of the the, uh, of the of the of the the literary tradition. By the way, Du Bois, who was also quite uh, radical and founded the NACP and among other things, wrote a beautiful book called Souls of Black Folk. Um, he I had a, have a quotation. From him about Lincoln, he wrote a, you know, he edited the, the for a long time the NACP magazine, The Crisis, um, and uh, uh, he he uh, he wrote it something rather critical of Lincoln, and got uh, sort of uh, a lot of feedback about it, a lot of negative feedback about it, 
And here's what he said in the response to the feedback, among other things. He said, I revere him. I revere him the more because up out of his contradictions and inconsistencies, he fought his way to the pinnacles of earth and his fight was within as well as without. And then he says, I care more for Lincoln's great toe than for the whole body of the perfect George Washington who never told a lie and never did anything else interesting. <laughs> it's, uh, but you know, the, the, and, and, and by the way, Obama, uh, I have somewhere here on my, my disheveled desk, a, a quotation from Obama about uh, saying, and, uh, you know, yes, I, I recognize um, his, uh, his limitations, but the way he struggled with them, the way he was constantly able to, uh, to work towards transcending them uh, is worthy of my admiration. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of uh, examples of, of African-American affirmations of Lincoln that, that, um, that don't sugarcoat him, don't present him as a Carl Sandburg fantasy, um, that recognize uh, his, the rough edges. Um, he, it, it, there are some biographies that claim that he used uh, all kinds of language, including the, the N-word uh, in, uh, in his casual discourse. And he was well known for being a man who loved, uh, you know, dirty jokes and ethnic jokes and, and that kind of thing. And as Du Bois says, he was a, a lower class uh, uh, white from, you know, sort of unpropitious circumstances. What do you expect? Uh, and the interesting thing is not what he came from, but what he rose into, and which goes back to my land of hope thing that the aspirational quality and that this is something that it's not, uh, it's, 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 it's living a thing for someone like W.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, uh, Ralph Ellison, as it is for, you know, uh, Horatio Alger <laughs> or, you know, uh, the, the kind of uh, you know, usual model uh, that's held up of a white, uh, um, entrepreneur or person on the rise, and Obama too. I should have. I, how could I leave out Obama? I mean, uh, and Obama uh, um, appropriated Lincoln to an extraordinary degree in his rise, and uh, um, it, it, maybe it was a gimmick. Uh, maybe it wasn't. Um, it's always hard to say with politicians what's in their heart of hearts, but what it was was effective. It tapped into something about Lincoln that we admire, uh, and and we admire the person who gravitates towards that uh, in his or her life. Well, maybe we can take one more question here. With okay. apologies, I know we had a list of questions. Some of them are on common themes. This is a question from a student who I think is concerned with issues of activism today and um, who writes that you said that politics is the art of the possible in the sense that it creates possibilities. What about policy that can't afford to rest its merit on possibility? Aren't there some things that are so urgent that change can't be prudent and shrewd and careful? Um, well, you know, I I think one of the burdens of of that, and of course the urgency of now, is one of Martin Luther King's famous phrases that Obama appropriated. But um, why we can't wait? Another Kingism, and King, yeah, King was a ameliorist uh, uh, by comparison to Malcolm and others. Uh, um, I think the bur there's a burden of proof, though, on if we're talking on a level of generalization. Uh, uh, if, if something is not possible, it doesn't, if it doesn't fit into the art of the possible, then is it perchance impossible? And trying to do the impossible um, 
is not a great formula for political effectiveness, for achieving the goals that you want to achieve. If you, um, and, and uh, again, I think it's hard when we're talking a level of access. I really appreciate the respectfulness with which the question is, is phrased. And, uh, and I, I want to be equally respectful in answering it. Um, but it, it is, um, I think there are cases in which change um, is so necessary that um, uh, it may be necessary to countermand certain other commitments uh, in the pursuit of it. I, I just for example, reconstruction, because of the South's resistance to the reordering of its social institutions that really had to come, uh, that gave rise to things like the Black Codes and the Klan and, and, and such. You know, we, we had a, a military occupation of the South and, and a division of the South into five, uh, you know, sort of military districts and, and a sort of elimination of the South's um, um, political um, you know, independence. Um, I, I think that was necessary. It was a, a very far reaching measure. And it, it arguably wasn't in the end all that successful, but um, that would be an example. I mean, there, there are times when, I mean, the most excruciating moral decisions in life come when the choice is not between good and evil, but between good and good. Uh, and a, a, a greater good or a greater amelioration of evil is more important, becomes more urgent um, than uh, the, the, the protection of the existing good. Um, I think of like Antigone, the, the play Antigone is a wonderful example of the collision of goods, of you know, uh, loyalty to the state and loyalty to one's family and to God, uh, or the gods in that case. Um, uh, the, these are an excruciating part of the human experience and, and uh, politics is not immune to them. Um, but did, did uh, for example, in the coming of the Civil War, did a figure like John Brown, uh, who uh, was, was fanatically committed to the cause of abolition with a, a enormous religious zeal. Um, did he um, hasten the, a, a civil war? Did he hasten the cause of emancipation or did he impede it or make it harder for emancipation to be an effective uh, entryway into, into genuine freedom? Uh, I think that's a real question that whether um, uh, violence, terror, uh, uh, it is, I think, it, you know, it's, it's, it's um, I won't say categorically that one never, ever, 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 ever resorts to it. Um, I certainly would defend the German officers who tried to, to kill Hitler. Um, during uh, the, the Second World War, even though uh, they were committing murder and they were also um, uh, violating, you know, sort of military codes and that kind of thing. I absolutely would defend the moral justice of that action, even though it was unsuccessful. Um, so I think there are instances, yes, in which, um, um, and King himself talks about, and I, I don't know whether this addresses what you're thinking about or not, but in the B Birmingham jail letter, the, the, the fact that an unjust law is not a law at all. But where does he get that? He gets that from Thomas Aquinas. He gets it from the great uh, tradition. And uh, that's part of what I'm trying to defend here is, is that there are there is a wisdom in the accumulation of law and uh, insight that um, I think we can ill afford to lose. Uh, I think there's, there's, uh, um, and here I will say the, the example of the Soviet Union, which is something that for my generation was a, 
a, a very important um, measure of, ha of, of the relationship between means and ends. Uh, the, the original ends of you know, Marxian communism were ones that uh, I can see being seen as admirable. I actually never found them admirable, but I, but the, you can see them as admirable, but also realize that the achievement of those ends um, is, will come at a cost that will vitiate any value of those ends. Just as I fear, and this is a smaller scale thing, but then our college campuses, the effort to, to proscribe dissent, to so pro proscribe certain kinds of speech um, is going to be ultimately self-defeating. Uh, and it's going to empty out the real vitality of our universities and our colleges and our, and our, and our public squares. So, um, uh, you know, again, it's, a, it's a, a good question. It's a very important question that at what point does, um, as we used to say in the 60s, working within the system um, uh, become uh, a recipe for, again, another 60s phrase, co-optation. That is having your, your aspirations turned against you. Um, it's very American to be impatient with institutions. This goes back a long way. Uh, um, and uh, um, I think some of our institutions have outlived their usefulness. Um, uh, and it's, I think it may be up to the rising generation to sort that out, to discern uh, that, that, uh, that winnowing that needs to take place. So, uh, you know, Lincoln, let me end with the Lincoln quotation, uh, uh, which I can't get exactly right, but it was, uh, he, he said, you know, we're, you cannot escape history, but you can think anew. Uh, we must, we must think anew and there that, and thereby we will save our nation. Um, he says it much better than that. That's a, that is a pitiful uh, uh, reflection of my bad memory, but uh, um, uh, I think Lincoln uh, wasn't a hidebound conservative in that sense. He was a cons he, he called himself a conservative. He said, a con "What is conservatism but a respect for what's tried and proven?" Um, uh, but in the end, uh, 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 you could argue that he's a far more radical figure than he's given credit for being. Um, some people I know who respect a lot would take issue with my presentation of him as being a um, prudential, moderate, um, careful leader and say at every step, he was taking enormous ch chances and that from very early on, his actual attitudes towards the means to be used to abolish slavery were more out there than what he was willing to show. Um, you know, this is why we have 14,000 books. <laughs> A lot of different views of Lincoln. Um, and, you know, uh, politicians rarely disclose with absolute clarity what it is they're up to. Um, and there's a reason for that. Well, thank you so much, Professor McClay. I have to ask you, as someone who grew up in Illinois, and my mother used to tell us stories about Lincoln. Her grandfather, who was a farmer, was at the convention in Chicago that nominated Lincoln in 1860. And uh, she told a story about Lincoln as prankster, that he would lift his brother upside down. So if I've gotten this straight, so that his brother, who had mud on his feet, would put muddy footprints across the ceiling of their little pioneer farmhouse so that when their mother got home she would see you know these muddy footprints across the ceiling now yeah. i don't know if that's folklore well, i've or heard not. story i've never heard that story i've heard stories about him being a prankster i was born in illinois too right, yeah. um, downstate well in champaign sure. um, where the university is located and uh so I have, I grew up with the sort of land of Lincoln lore 
um, in in my in my blood, uh, and uh, he is definitely. Uh, but think what the center of the universe Illinois was. I mean, the convention in Chicago, uh, the Republican convention, running against Stephen Douglas, <laughs> the senator Abraham Lincoln. I mean, that Illinois was the center of the world. Not so much yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to everybody. We had thanks a, to all uh, of you. It was uh, great to uh, listen to you, learn from you, and have the conversation with the questions with you. So apologies to those of you that we didn't get to your questions. Uh, yes, but, but I my fault. I'm too long-winded. I know no, it. No, it was it was great. I encourage everyone to uh, get your book, uh, Land of Hope, and. Uh, uh, it's it's really worth uh, worth the read, and uh, also if you want to check out our upcoming events uh, this spring, uh, please look at BucknellLeaders.org online. That's one word: BucknellLeaders.org. And thank you again so much, Professor McClay, and thanks to everybody who attended tonight. Thanks to all of you.